Okay, so I guess it's time to start now. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, and welcome to this first uh, series uh, event of 2023. And we are uh, kicking off our uh, new year uh, with a student research seminar. And uh, as I was saying before, I'll leave it to our uh, host for today, Professor uh, Luth Richter, to properly introduce our, our speaker for today. Uh, before uh, I leave the floor to Luth, um, I would just like to uh, give you a quick, uh, few quick uh, directions on how to uh, use uh, the platform. So uh, at the bottom of the page, you will uh, find a few buttons. Uh, if you click on the people, uh, sorry, well, you, you don't really need to go through the people button. You already have the chat button uh, as an individual button uh, at the bottom of, of, the, uh, of the window. So, uh, you can click there to access the chat, and so throughout the presentation, you can uh, uh, type in uh, questions for our for our speaker, and um, they will be picked up uh, by uh, by us at the end of the presentation for uh, for the Q and A session. And of course, uh, if at the end of the presentation you will uh, instead be inclined to unmute and ask your question live, uh, we, we kindly invite you uh, to do so. We'll, uh, really, uh, we really appreciate a nice uh, live discussion. So um, yeah, if, um, so uh, as you prefer, you can either type your questions or, or, or ask them live at the end, at the end of the presentation. So enough for me and Luth, you, you can take it from here. Massimo, thank you, but uh, most of all, thank you to Adriana, uh, who volunteered to, to uh, talk to us today and uh, give this presentation. And uh, so we'll be hearing something about the, the influence of gravity, of reduced gravity, on the mobility performance of lunar and planetary rovers and how to predict the mobility performance uh, for reduced gravity levels as found on the moon, as on Mars, uh, you know, smaller bodies. And this is a, I would say, one of the key problems in, in planetary rovers development. On the one hand, how to model the effect of gravity. And on the one hand, to how to define and implement testing methods to, to verify the mobility in Earth-based um tests and one could say yeah obviously the um the weight of the rover under test at earth gravity certainly is influenced by gravity so why can't we just scale the weight of the rover uh under test on earth or why don't we offload a portion of its weight yeah that that's like half of the problem because um Gravity also influences the, the stress-strain behavior of the terrain. And that obviously is very hard to replicate in, in Earth-based uh, tests. And that's why this research is very, very important um, in the domain of planetary and lunar rovers. And Adriana, she's a PhD candidate uh, with Concordia University in uh, the Montreal area in Canada. And um, she's actually, I think most of the time, Adriana, you're working at JPL. Um, and uh, yes, so you've been presenting, uh, I guess, two years ago at the ISTVS online conference that we had. And then last year in October, we had the, the symposium, the North America's uh, symposium in, in Montreal. Um, which I was not able to attend in person, unfortunately, at short notice, but you were there. And uh, people know you also from, from papers and publications, uh, and also your, your advisor, Chris, um, 
Right, so uh, we're looking forward to the talk. And um, yes, take it away, Adriana. Great, thanks. Let me just uh, start sharing my screen here. So, yes, as Luke's mentioned, I um, am from Concordia University. I actually just defended my thesis last week, so I'm no longer officially a student or a PhD candidate. Um, and yeah, also I have been doing a lot of uh, visiting research work with JPL um, throughout my PhD. And I'm actually going to be starting there as like a full-time um, employee in a couple of weeks. So that's just a little life update from me. Um, but today I'll be presenting my PhD work entitled Predicting Planetary Rover Mobility in Reduced Gravity Using 1G Experiments. So the motivation for my work really looks covered pretty much what the motivation is, but um, it's really the fact that one of the major challenges that are that planetary exploration rovers face today is the negotiation of difficult terrain. And some examples of this on the moon and Mars, um, really traversing loose granular regolith has proven to be um, a problem in the past um, in these reduced gravity conditions. So a couple of examples of that, we have the lunar roving vehicle on the moon. Um, during the Apollo 15 mission, actually one of its wheels became stuck and the astronauts had to pick up and move the vehicle to another location in order to fix the problem. And then on the right hand side of the slide here, we have uh, the wheels of NASA's Mars rover Spirit, which similarly became stuck in loose soil. And this sadly led to the end of its mission, even after attempting to free it for many months. They set up a testing ground here on Earth, tried to replicate this situation um, and maneuvers that proved successful to get out of the sand trap on Earth did not prove to be successful um, on Mars. And one of the major differences, of course, is the effect of reduced gravity on the soil. Um, so the gravity level on Mars is about one third of Earth's gravity and on the moon, for example, it's about one sixth. So just uh, so to, to put that into context for, you know, solar system exploration, Earth is actually the largest rocky body in our solar system. So if we want to drive any rover on a rocky body anywhere in the solar system, we will have to deal with reduced gravity. Um, in my research, I've mo mainly been focusing on lunar gravity levels, um, a little bit on Martian gravity levels. So, you know, we can interpolate between those two points to any of these other bodies shown here. Um, and then, you know, we can extrapolate down to the lower gravity levels, but um, there might be some limitations to that um, for the research methods I'm using, but that has yet to be explored. So just to introduce some existing mobility testing methods, um, as Lutz mentioned in the intro, one of the most commonly used methods is actually reduced weight testing. And in this type of method, the weight on the test rover is altered to emulate the gravitational acceleration of the rover's destination. So, for example, here on the left, we have Scarecrow, which is a 3 8 mass version of the Curiosity rover, which mimics the wheel loads that Curiosity experiences on Mars. Um, and then on the right, we have a, an image showing gravity offload testing, where we have a cable pulling up on the rover to simulate lunar gravity. Now, these type of testing methods, of course, do accurately represent the effect of gravity on the weight of the rover, but they do not mimic the effect of gravity on the response of the soil. And this is an important factor that is not always considered in rover testing. So a couple of testing methods do attempt to account for the effect of reduced gravity on the soil response, and one of them involves matching soil test instrument response with specialized soil simulants. So the, the prime example for that that I've been looking at in my research is the soil simulant GRC-1. And this simulant was designed to match, well, it was designed at NASA's Glenn Research Center, and it was designed to match the cone penetrometer readings taken during Apollo missions. So a cone penetrometer, if you don't know, you probably do know if we're uh, in, you know, in the terra mechanics community, but um, it's an instrument that measures the pressure required to insert a cone on a long shaft into the ground. 
And in the design of GRC1, it was assumed that if we replicate the cone penetrometer response of the lunar soil in lunar gravity, then we will also replicate its response to vehicle loading. So in other words, the, um, the, the wheel performance is expected to be the same regardless of the gravity level, as long as the cone penetrometer response is equivalent. Um, and also another thing to note is that when this method is used, it's usually also used with reduced loads. So it's essentially an extension of the reduced weight testing method. And the next method that does also attempt to account for reduced gravity effects is what I call granular scaling laws, um, or what is called granular scaling laws. So this method is really a framework for predicting wheel performance of different sized wheels or um, wheels in what predicting performance in one gravity level based on tests in another gravity level. And this is done using dimensionless numbers. So I'll get into more details of this method later on, but essentially it's, it's similar to if you've ever seen um, wind tunnel tests with scale model aircraft where they match, you know, the Reynolds number and all the different flow characteristics with the dimensionless numbers, it's uh, very similar to that. So just a little outline of where my research has focused for my PhD. So uh, the main umbrella topic is really planetary rover mobility testing, and I've mainly been focusing on driving in loose regolith. Um, I've done mostly work for straight driving with a little bit of looking at skid steer rovers. Um, and I've mainly been focused on single wheel testing I have investigated normal force control in single wheel test beds, um, but due to time constraints, I won't be able to talk about that today. I do have a paper in the Journal of Terror Mechanics on that if you're interested. Um, so yeah, I've mostly been focused on single wheel tests with a little bit of full rover testing um, during my uh, research position at JPL. And then finally, the main topic for my research is accounting for these reduced gravity effects on the soil. So I've been looking at the three testing methods I just introduced and essentially validating or evaluating those methods against data from reduced gravity parabolic flight experiments. So the contributions of my research, I'm just gonna give kind of an outline of, you know, what work has previously been done in this area and then how our research group has extended that previous work. So the, the first thing I've done in my PhD was assessing the accuracy of three, the three 1G rover testing methods that I just introduced. So the first one, reduced weight testing. There were some previous uh, single wheel tests done on parabolic flights. Um, so Kobayashi et al, they measured uh, performance of a self-propelled wheel in various gravity conditions and various wheel loads and measured you know, the horizontal travel distance, the sinkage, and the wheel torque. Um, however, in our group, we did very similar experiments, but we did slip controlled experiments where we could actually directly measure the, uh, the drawbar pull of the wheel. And we were also the first to collect uh, the wheel soil interaction imagery, you know, through the glass sidewall of the sandbox, which I will show you um, the schematic of our apparatus shortly. Um, so we're the first to collect that in reduced gravity. And then for method two, which I call in my work, the equal G method, uh, G capital G, uh, referring to the cone index gradient, which is the metric that we're matching um, with the, the different gravity level tests. There was no previous work, experimental work in reduced gravity flights or anything like that um, to validate this method or those assumptions that were made in the design of GRC1. Uh, so in our work, we were the first to experimentally evaluate that method. And then for the granular scaling laws, we're, in my work, I'm specifically looking at a version of them that is proposed by Sloanaker et al. recently, um, I think 2017, that paper came out. <clears throat> so there were some similar scaling laws derived previously that were a little bit less general um, but there were some reduced gravity flights, uh, I think they were by Japanese researchers, and um, they were validated in reduced gravity flights. But for the, the more general scaling laws, uh, Sloanaker's version, 
that I'm looking at in my research, the gravity variant version of those was only validated in discrete element method simulations previously. So we were the first to evaluate those um, experimentally in reduced gravity. We also added a new output term to those um, dimensionless numbers for um, dimensionless sinkage. Um, and then we also did some investigations to how they perform in mildly cohesive soils for the first time, as well as looking into the limitations um, in terms of the different wheel sizes and wheel aspect ratios uh, variation between the test pairs that can be used. I'll go into those details um, later on. And then also as part of my research, as I mentioned, I was um, involved with some research at JPL where I actually was able to successfully apply the granular scaling law method to different test campaigns for uh, rovers that are under development currently. And then finally, as I mentioned, the normal force control methods in single wheel test beds. I won't be talking about that today, but that's another, um, another contribution of my research throughout my PhD. So now going into the fun stuff, the experimental setup. So this is a specialized test apparatus that was designed to meet the constraints imposed by reduced gravity parabolic flights. On the left, you can see the test bed configured for wheel tests. So essentially the wheel drives across the sandbox and we can measure wheel performance data such as the drawbar pull force, the sinkage of the wheel. We can measure the motor current, which is used to then calculate the power required, required by the wheel. Um, and we, of course, can also collect the subsurface soil imagery. So the sandbox has a glass side wall, and we have a camera and a mirror set up such that we can see the subsurface soil interactions. Um, and then on the right, the test bed is configured for cone penetrometer testing, so we can measure the pressure required to insert that cone into the sand. Um, and then also we have an automated soil preparation system. So this involves aeration of the soil. So blowing soil through the bottom of the sandbox to loosen the soil, and then we vibrate uh, to compact it to a repeatable state between, between tests. So just to go into some of the results from the first flight campaign that was done with this test bed. So, this flight campaign, the actual reduced gravity flights were done before I even joined the lab, uh, the aerospace robotics lab at Concordia. Uh, but then I performed the on ground experiments for comparison and a lot of the data analysis. So I'll just really briefly go over this flight campaign. Uh, but this campaign, we were looking at a single wheel driving in loose regolith. Um, and we were specifically looking at the reduced weight testing method and validating that against uh, reduced gravity parabolic flights. And essentially in these experiments, the, the wheel loads were the same in the reduced gravity and 1G test. So really the only difference between the, uh, the corresponding tests was the effect of reduced gravity on the soil itself. So this test campaign was looking at a Rosalind Franklin rover. So that's the upcoming ESA, um, the ExoMars mission. Um, it was a prototype wheel for that mission, driving in Martian soil simulant ES2 in three different gravity levels. And essentially, this test campaign showed that method one, the reduced weight testing method, overestimates the wheel performance. So the wheel in 1G had higher drawbar pull and lower sinkage than what we saw in the Martian G or Lunar G test. And here on the right, we have the results from the the processed subsurface soil video. Um, so you can see these images are showing the estimated soil velocity beneath the wheel. Um, and this is uh, throughout the time of the experiment and in each gravity level. And you can see that as gravity decreases, there's a lot more soil mobilization beneath the wheel. And these are, the, like I said earlier, the effect of gravity on the soil was isolated in these experiments. Now going into the second parabolic flight campaign with this test bed, we performed very similar experiments. Um, however, in these tests, we were looking at the next two testing methods. So the specialized soil simulants or the equal capital G method um, and the scaling laws. And then again, 
validating those with reduced gravity flights. So in this campaign, we tested wheels in um, GRC1, and we were looking again at the method of matching the cone penetrometer response or the capital G cone index gradient. And then we found that, again, this method um, also overestimated the wheel performance with higher drawbar pull and lower sinkage in the 1G test compared to what we saw in lunar G. However, on the other hand, the granular scaling laws actually performed a lot better with less than 10% error on each metric. And when it did err, it was actually on the conservative side, which is um, very beneficial for a testing method. Um, and then here are just some in images showing the wheels that we tested, as well as the apparatus installed in the aircraft. Um, and then you can see me in the back running the experiments and our research associate Dom over here on the left side of the image. So just to go into some more detailed results from this flight campaign, um, here we have the cone index gradient, capital G values plotted versus relative density. So we tested the, we did cone penetrometer measurements at three different relative densities um, in 1G and in 1.6G or lunar gravity. Um, and what these results really show is that the shear strength of the soil appears to be greatly reduced in reduced gravity because the soil preparation was performed in 1G. So for each corresponding density, the density was the same um, and just the gravity level was different. Um, and as we all know, probably the cone index gradient is influenced by both the density of the soil and the shear strength. Um, and if the density was the same, then only the shear strength could be reduced to cause such a great reduction in the cone index gradient. So we saw about four times lower on average uh, cone index gradients in the 1.6G. Now here's basically the same plot, but with some extra info to illustrate the conditions for the wheel tests that were performed. So in reduced gravity, in the lunar gravity, we performed wheel tests um, at the highest density, at the highest relative density. And then later in the lab, we found a lower density soil preparation that in 1G produces the same cone index gradient. So a, a G of two. Um, and these were the conditions for the equal G method, the equal cone index gradient method. Of course, they're lined up here on the Y axis. So we performed the test in a lower density soil in 1G and a higher density soil in uh, 1.6G and um, compared those results. And then for the granular scaling law method, we performed um, those 1G tests at the same relative density as was done in the flight test. Um, and we perform those with a smaller wheel. So to go more into more detail with the granular scaling laws and how they work, essentially this is the function which was slightly modified from the originally proposed function. It's an unspecified function with three outputs and five inputs, and they're all non-dimensional numbers. So on the output side, we have um, dimensionless drawbar pull, sinkage, and power. And on the input side, we have a uh, non-dimensional time term, a wheel shape function term, a gravity term, a size and mass term, and then a dimensionless velocity term. And how these scaling laws can be applied is essentially you have three scalers, Q, R, and S, shown down here. Um, and they can be actually chosen arbitrarily. Um, and you essentially can apply the scaling factors shown here, and you'll have the same inputs to um, your unspecified function for a pair of scaled tests. So for example, if you look at the dimensionless velocity term and you apply um, these scalars Q, uh, Q to G and R to L, then you have in the denominator here, the Q and R under the square root. <clears throat> and then if you um, look down here, the the velocity must be scaled by the square root of q times r, which um, then all of those scaling factors cancel out from the uh, dimensionless numbers. So you have the same input to your uh, unspecified function, and this, this the scaling laws should apply. And then the outputs of the test are scaled as shown down at the bottom of this slide. 
So for our test, we basically chose um, parameters that would fit within the operating limits of the test bed. So we had a wheel with half of the radius, two thirds of the width, and then all of the other parameters scale as shown in this table here. Now to go into some of the results, here we have the dimensionless drawbar pull um, at 20% slip on the left and 70% slip on the right. And an important thing to note for these plots is that the granular scaling laws actually only um, apply to steady state. So we kind of don't really want to compare the results at the first five or so seconds of the experiments. Um, but the essentially what we want to see here is the um, the lunar G results are shown in the blue solid lines, and then the equal G method or equal cone index gradient method is shown in the red um, dotted line, and the granular scaling law method prediction is shown in the green dashed line. So what we can see here is that, as I mentioned earlier, the equal G method is actually overestimating how much drawbar pull the wheel will have compared to what was actually seen in lunar gravity. Whereas on the other hand, the granular scaling law method is more accurately predicting the drawbar pull. And, you know, it's a bit more accurate at 20% slip and then at 70% slip, um, it's actually underestimating the amount of drawbar pull that the wheel will have. So it's more of a conservative prediction. And then if we look at the sinkage results, it's essentially the same thing where a, the equal G method is predicting less sinkage. Therefore, it's overestimating the performance. Um, of the wheel, and then the granular scaling laws are much more accurate, especially at 20% slip, and then at 70% slip, the granular scaling laws are, you know, a bit less accurate, but at least they're on the conservative side. They're predicting a bit more sinkage than what we saw in lunar gravity. And just to compare, you know, actual numbers instead of reading off a plot, we can see here the job pull, sinkage, and power. Um, at 20% slip and 70% slip, and the average of both for the equal G method, cone, in equal cone index gradient method, and then on the right, the same thing for the granular scaling laws. And again, you can see that the scaling laws performed better. So this is the mean squared percentage error. So lower numbers uh, mean it's less error. Um, and you can see the errors much lower for the granular scaling law method, especially at 20% slip. Um, and again, do you recall that when the GSL method did err, it was on the conservative side, whereas the equal G method was non-conservative. Now to look at some of the image analysis results. So these images, again, are showing the processed subsurface soil videos. Um, and these are processed using a te technique. It's a computer vision algorithm called the soil optical flow technique. Essentially, it just estimates the soil velocity between frames of the video. So here we can see um, video or the processed images um, averaged in five second increments um, throughout the experiments. Um, and then at the top, we have the 1.6G. In the middle, we have granular scaling law results. And then at the bottom, we have the equal cone index, cone index gradient method. And just to note, the wheel is traveling from right to left in these images. Um, so a couple of things to note in these images. So at the on the granular or sorry on the 16G or lunar G results, you can see there's like a region of soil motion at the front of the wheel. Um, and in the granular scaling law test, so these tests are scaled down. Remember the radius is scaled down by one half, so that's why the, the soil motion region is smaller. Um, but geometrically, they look similar, right? So they have also in the granular scaling law test, there is a region of soil motion, you know, at the surface of the soil near the front of the wheel being pushed by the wheel. Um, whereas in the equal G method, the equal cone index gradient method, the soil near the front of the wheel is actually being pushed down um, in front of the wheel. And there's this deeper um, region of soil motion near the front of the wheel. Whereas in the equal G and 1.6 G test, the the region of the deepest soil motion is actually towards the back of the wheel. So we can also look at um, this normalized kind of to see, you know, how this looks when the granular scaling laws are, or when the, the scaled wheel is um, 
scaled up to match uh, the, the size of the other whales. And so essentially this is also plotted on kind of polar coordinates with the um, angle from surface normal on the x-axis and the, um, the distance from the wheel rim normalized by the wheel radius on the y-axis. And you can see again the similar pattern where there's this region of soil motion in front of the wheel for the GSL test and the lunar G test that's not seen in the equal G method test. And again, there's like that deeper soil motion region um, towards the front of the wheel for the equal G method, um, which is not seen for the other two tests. So this really shows that the granular scaling laws were able to, you know, capture some of these qualitative soil behaviors beneath the wheel that were not the, that were not captured by the equal cone index gradient method. And another thing we can look at, of course, is the direction of soil motion beneath the wheel. So here again on the top, we have the lunar G test, in the middle is the GSL test, and then at the bottom is the equal G method, the equal cone index gradient method. And again, looking at that region of soil motion in front of the wheel, you can see the soil is being pushed forward in front of the wheel in lunar gravity and in um, the granular scaling law test in 1G, whereas in the equal cone index gradient test in 1G, the soil is actually being pushed down at the front of the wheel and being compacted in front of the wheel. So this type of soil motion, of course, can cause bulldozing resistance where, you know, the reaction forces from the soil being pushed forward can push back on the wheel and reduce the drawbar pull. So this may be one of the mechanisms for the lower drawbar pull that we saw in lunar G and with the granular scaling law test um, that we did not see with the equal cone index gradient method test. So now going into uh, the next phase of the research. So we, um, we are preparing for further reduced gravity experiments to test these methods in a co slightly cohesive soil simulant. Um, we did originally plan to do these parabolic flight experiments, you know, in September, but there was, there was a lot of delays um, due to the aircraft maintenance, so we could not do them yet. So in the meantime, I've done some experiments in 1G to evaluate um, the scaling loss in a mildly cohesive soil simulant. So lunar regolith is estimated to be mildly cohesive. So this is, I mean, if you compare this to clay uh, soils here on earth, you know, with cohesions of 100 to 1000 kilopascals, this is quite low, you know, 0.1 to 1 kilopascals, but it's not zero. So it might, you know, it might, um, it might affect the wheel performance. Um, so this is something we wanted to investigate. Um, so there was also a new term for granular scaling laws for cohesive soils that was recently proposed. So this term has um, a, uh, a density term, in, density value in the um, numerator with the, <clears throat> along with the gravity and wheel radius, and then it has a cohesion stress in the denominator. And this actually adds constraint. Well, if you assume that, you know, it's difficult to control this uh, critical density parameter and cohesion stress. I mean, it would potentially be possible to control the cohesion of a simulant. Um, but if we assume that that's, you know, not something we want to try, then the only parameter we have to play with uh, for, you know, testing in different gravity levels in order to make this dimensionless term equal for a, a pair of scaled tests, the only parameter we have to change is the wheel radius. So this essentially states that if we want to test in lunar G, um, or if we want to predict performance of a wheel in lunar G in a cohesive soil, then we have to um, scale the radius by one sixth uh, on Earth in our on Earth tests. So, as, like since this, you know, this type of method, if we want to test one sixth scaled wheels and rovers, it would introduce some technical difficulties to, you know, build such small prototypes and test beds. I wanted to see how much error would be introduced if we actually ignore this co uh, constraint since the cohesion of lunar regolith is estimated to be quite low. Um, so we did select a new soil simulant for this testing. Um, it's LMS1, so Lunar Mare Simulant 1 from Exolith Lab. 
Um, and then you can just see here the comparison of how the grains look between the GRC1, lunar regolith, and the LMS1. So, the, the tests that I wanted to do to test the, you know, in 1G to test if this cohesion constraint um, is important for mildly cohesive soils without actually getting to do the lunar gravity tests in the meantime, um, we decided to test with a 1 6 radius wheel, uh, which does follow the cohesion constraint that I just mentioned. And then we also wanted to test with the one half scaled wheel, uh, which does not follow the cohesion constraint. So by comparing the results from these two wheels in 1G, we can estimate how much error is introduced by ignoring the cohesion constraint. So just to give you some results, these are the first results from this, um, this investigation. So <clears throat> essentially, these plots are showing on the left the um, dimensionless drawbar pull, and then on the right dimensionless sinkage at different slip values. Um, and we can see that, you know, the results, if the scaling laws were applied properly, the results should match between these experiments, the dimensionless results. However, they are not matching up. And, you know, this could suggest that the cohesion constraint is important and cannot be ignored. However, um, we, since we didn't have the lunar gravity results yet, we couldn't really confirm whether that was the case or whether it was due to something else with the scaling laws. So I decided to, in order to test this, we could do the same experiments in GRC1, which is essentially cohesionless. Therefore, the cohesion constraint should not apply and um, the scaling laws should work properly and the experiments should match up um, between those uh, experiments. So here are the results with GRC1. And again, they're not matching up. So this really shows that, you know, something else is going on with the scaling laws between the, this pair of wheels. It's not working properly. So there's something else going on. It's not due to the cohesion. Um, so <laughs> essentially, it's either due. So okay, one of the, the problems with this tiny wheel, the one six wheel that we had is we actually made the aspect ratio of the wheel a lot wider. And we did this because according to the scaling laws, if you have a wider wheel, you can apply a higher wheel load. And, you know, if we kept the aspect ratio the same for the one sixth wheel, we would have to apply very low loads to the wheel. And with our test bed set up, you know, this was not really feasible. So we decided to make that aspect ratio wider so we could apply a, a more consistent and higher load. Um, however, this may be causing problems with the, the scaling law validity. Um, another issue is potentially the size, just the size of the wheel itself relative to, you know, the grain size of the soil. So again, we wanted to test the cohesion constraint without the lunar gravity test. So the next idea we came up with was to test with the two larger wheels instead. And now so now this medium sized wheel is now a one six uh, scaled wheel relative to, you know, a theoretical huge wheel driving in lunar G. So this one follows the cohesion constraint. And now we're testing against the large wheel, which we assume does not follow the cohesion constraint relative to this new theoretical huge wheel. And one other problem we ran into uh, with these tests is that the load on the largest wheel had to be six times higher than the load on the medium wheel. So Without significant modifications to the test bed, we could only test at low slip due to motor limitations. So the first thing we did was testing in GRC1 uh, with the two larger wheels. Um, so these plots are showing the old results with the two smaller wheels in blue and green for ease of comparison, and then the new results with the two larger wheels um, uh, in the orange and gray. So you can see that um, although not perfect, you can see the scaling laws are working much better. So the, the results are closer together for those two larger wheels than they were for the two smaller wheels in GRC1. So this was an encouraging result. And then we decided to go ahead and test in LMS1 to really see, you know, um, to really test what we wanted to test from the beginning, which was looking at if this cohesion constraint can be ignored. So now here are the results in LMS1. And again, 
we can see the old results in the blue and green um, with the two smaller wheels and then the new results in the orange and gray with the two larger wheels. And since the, the new results are very close together and they're dimensionless results, we can, con we can conclude that, well, we can say that potentially the cohesion constraint can be ignored for mildly cohesive soils, at least at low slip values. But of course, in the future, we will want to test this um, in reduced gravity parabolic flights. So just to summarize kind of everything I just talked about, uh, we did see some limitations of the granular scaling loss in terms of the wheel size, the aspect ratio variation between the scaled pair um, or both. Um, so looking at what previous researchers have found, <clears throat> there were some observations that if the sinkage of the wheel was not sufficient, then the, the granular scaling law predictions weren't accurate. And it was suggested that the sinkage should be at least 10 times the average particle size of the soil, um, which was, you know, this condition was met in most of our tests um, that I just showed. Another uh, thing I noticed in the literature is that in the previous GSL validation work looking at different sized wheels, um, you know, they, the aspect ratio variation between the, the pair of wheels was never more than about 50%. However, in our test with the two smaller wheels, the aspect ratio variation was over 200%. So this might be, you know, kind of getting up to the limits of what the scaling loss can do. So based on the available data we have so far, uh, it is definitely recommended to uh, have the wheel be large enough such that the sinkage is at least 10 times the average particle size and keep the aspect ratio, ratio variation to less than about 50%. And then again, the cohesion constraint can, we do have some evidence that it can like, likely be ignored for mildly cohesive soils at low slip. Now to just briefly go over some <clears throat> of the applications of GSL. So the first one um, was looking at a skid steer rover um, and we applied the scaling laws to uh, 1G tests for that, uh, for single wheel tests with a skid steer rover. So this rover mission is, um, it's called Cadre. It's basically a team of small rovers that will um, explore the lunar surface cooperatively. And they are skid steer rovers. So of course that means that the wheels don't turn explicitly. Um, and in order to command a turn, you have to command the left and right uh, wheels at different velocities. And this, of course, does lead to high sinkage during, especially during point turns. Um, and, you know, during initial prototype testing with this rover, they did see a lot of sinkage. So we wanted to investigate how, you know, different wheel design options could be used to reduce the sinkage. So for this uh, campaign, we used a single wheel test bed at Concordia that is able to sort of mimic skid steer uh, maneuvers. So basically, if you look at this diagram of the skid steer rover, you can see that during a point turn maneuver, the, the wheels will follow the circular trajectory shown here, and they will be at an angle beta relative to the uh, tangent of the circle. And throughout the maneuver, they'll always be at this angle beta. So if we kind of unravel this circular trajectory to a straight line, we can fix the wheel at an angle beta drive it forward in a straight line um, and that should mimic the wheel soil interactions seen during the point turn. And another thing for this test is that we're looking at something called the tangent turning force, which is essentially the drawbar pull force of the wheel minus any lateral um, resistance forces from the soil. And a positive value represents the ability to perform the turn. So we looked at seven different wheel designs. Um, here we have the flight baseline design, uh, and then there's there was an option with closed sides, and this was thought to you know prevent soil from passing through the wheel and reduce sinkage in that way. And then some something similar, but with side browsers to enhance the traction. And then we tested you know a larger radius wheel, a larger width, and there was also this diagonal grouser wheel. Um, and a rounded profile. So the diagonal grouser wheel 
is shown here. Um, this is shown from below. You can see that during the point turn, the grousers are now uh, perpendicular to the direction of the wheel motion. So that's kind of how those are supposed to work uh, by, you know, being perpendicular to the wheel motion, they're going to uh, enhance your performance uh, in a turn. So essentially here's just a snapshot of the results at 80% um, slip, we're looking at the tangent turning force coefficient versus the maximum sinkage. So these are the two different metrics that we looked at and essentially going up and to the left on this plot means a better performing wheel. So the baseline design is shown here in the circle. You can see that all the designs actually did reduce the sinkage, but some of them also reduced the tangent turning force, which is not desirable. So really the only wheels that performed better were the two larger, so the uh, larger diameter wheel, the uh, larger width, and then the diagonal grousers also performed better. So since the, the diagonal grouser wheel was the only one that performed well without requiring a large, you know, any increase in mass to the wheel, since this is a very mass constrained mission, that one was selected for further testing. Um, so we also performed straight driving tests to uh, see how that, you know, how the diagonal grousers affected the straight driving performance. Um, you can see the drawbar pull versus slip on the left. Um, there's no significant difference in this in the drawbar pull uh, for the diagonal grousers versus the baseline wheel. And then on the right, we have the maximum sinkage. And interestingly, there might be, you know, slightly increased sinkage with the diagonal grousers in straight driving or, you know, in slope climbing. So there might be a trade off here between turning performance and straight driving or slope climbing performance. Um, and this needs to be, you know, decided uh, based on the mission requirements. Um, for that particular mission. So that was the result. And of course, the scaling laws were applied to these tests to represent performance in lunar gravity. And finally, um, the last um, application I'm going to show you today involves uh, testing with a full rover. So rather than single wheel tests, looking at a four wheeled rover in this case, uh, again, following the scaling laws. And then this particular application was looking more at steep terrain mobility, as well as obstacle climbing performance, but also at loose regolith. Um, so in this project, essentially, the granular scaling laws were applied to design of these subscale prototypes, uh, which are one quarter scale models of a potential lunar rover. Um, and they they're reconfigurable platforms that were designed to be, you know, manually reconfigured to test up to 11 different locomotion modes um, and looking especially at steep terrain mobility. And essentially my role in this project was, you know, applying the scaling laws to the design of these rovers. So they both follow, as I said, a one quarter scale, um, compared to a, a full size rover that we're trying to predict its performance in lunar gravity uh, based on the scaling laws shown here. And now finally going into the conclusions and future work. So to summarize everything we talked about, um, we saw that method one, the reduced weight testing method does overestimate the wheel performance. So we saw better performance performance in 1G compared to the Lunar G and Martian G tests with that test campaign. And then method two, the method of matching the soil's cone penetrometer response, again, overestimated wheel performance. However, these tests were performed in the same soil, so GRC1 uh, in 1G and Lunar G. However, we will, I mean, not me personally, but my research group um, after I leave is going to perform more reduced gravity flights. So we'll compare the performance um, in LMS1 in uh, reduced gravity to GRC1 in 1G. It might perform, this method might perform a little bit better um, in that scenario. It'll be very interesting to see those results. Um, the flights are currently planned for the end of March. So fingers crossed that they don't have further delays and that we can see you know, what these results will show us. Um, and then for the method three granular scaling loss, we did see that it does provide an accurate and conservative method for predicting wheel performance, at least again in cohesionless soil in GRC1. 
and then for the mildly cohesive soils, it does appear from these 1G experiments that we did that the cohesion constraint can likely be ignored at least at low slip values. Um, and then, of course, we did observe those limitations in terms of the wheel size and the wheel aspect ratio. <clears throat> and then for the, uh, yeah, for future work regarding this method, again, on the same parabolic flights, they will be testing this, uh, this method in the soil simulant LMS1 compare so to compare um, the on ground experiments to that to confirm these findings. And uh, finally, for you know guidelines for 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 testing planetary rovers in 1G, the granular scaling laws based on the data available to this date, they are the recommended method for representing reduced gravity performance with 1G tests. Um, and again, like I said, the cohesion constraint, again, this was that the radius ratio must be the inverse of the gravity ratio. This can, based on the data we've collected so far, can most likely be ignored uh, for the mildly cohesive soils. And again, uh, we do recommend that the wheel should be large enough such that the sinkage has at least 10 times the average particle size of your soil. Um, and then also keep the variation in the aspect ratio to less than about 50% based on what we've seen. Um, and finally, an important note for the granular scaling loss is that the test should be performed in a soil stimulant that is as similar as possible to your regolith at the rover's destination. You know, unless you're, you know, playing with um, the different parameters and scaling the, the, um, the soil properties according to the scaling laws. Um, and then also, you know, if you're testing uh, in a soil with different properties than what you expect at the destination, you should at least interpret your, your results accordingly. And then for the, um, the final recommendations, so we did see that the gravity offload test or reduced weight testing method and um, also, the equal G, the equal cone index gradient method did overestimate wheel performance. So if you're performing, you know, non granular scaling law tests in, with these methods, then you should definitely apply safety margins to those results. And another option could be to, you know, do two sets of tests with one using the conservative method of GSL and one using a non conservative method like the equal G method, when you can assume that your rover performance will fall somewhere between those two predictions. And then the final recommendation, recommendation was from my normal force uh, investigation. So we did see that if you see normal force oscillations in your test bed um, and you want to eliminate those, you can use a mechanism like a four bar mechanism or another type of you know, normal force control method to, um, to control those. But I, that's something else that we can discuss um, outside of this presentation. So, I would just like to acknowledge these organizations for financial and or technical support through my work. Um, and uh, that's it for me. I look forward to the discussion that we'll have. Well, great. Um, yeah, I've been watching very closely the slides and uh, I hope the others too. Yeah, thanks very much, Adriana for the talk itself. And uh, no, happy to hear that you finished the PhD, that you defended the, the PhD successfully and that you're really moving on to JPL. Uh, yeah, congratulations to that. And um, yeah, right. So let's open it up for discussion. And uh, I've seen one or two comments in the chat. Maybe we start off with those if I'm able to open the chat. Uh, Andres was asking a question in the chat. Uh, how did you get access to the parabolic flights? Were there any interesting challenges with the experiments during the flights? Um, the latter, I'm sure, is affirmative. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Especially, um, how did you secure uh, the flight opportunities for which program or something? Yes, definitely. So the, the flights, um, so the, there's a grant from the Canadian Space Agency that opens up, I believe, every two years. It's called the FAST program, um, FAST 
I see it's like flights and field work for science and science and technology, flights for the advancement of science and technology, something like that. Um, so it's through the Canadian Space Agency. And they, um, the flights are actually conducted at the National Research Council of Canada in Ottawa. But the funding for it comes from the CSA. Um, so you can apply to those grants every, I think they open up every two years. So the last one, I believe, we applied in 2021. Still haven't conducted those flights yet, but um, they're in the pipeline for March. And um, as for the challenges, definitely there were lots of interesting challenges. I don't even know where to start <laughs> with that. I mean, everything, I mean, there's just, yeah, it's always Probably hard. spilling of soil, I'm sure, or something that happened frequently, right? Oh, um, not too much. So the test bed, well, we have like a double enclosure, like vinyl. I'll try to show the image um, here. So, oh, no, not that one. Here. Yeah, this one. So we have it enclosed. So at least there's no soil, you know, spilling out into the aircraft. Um, and then there's also like during the soil preparation, there's a lid here. It's shown here um, that closes for the soil prep. So, I mean, some soil does, you know, tend to escape from time to time, but that is controlled pretty well. But we did have um, different issues that came up with you know the soil preparation in the aircraft versus how it worked on the ground so one of the problems you can actually see in this image is that we did see a slope in the soil so this was not expected and you know they did during soil preparation try to maintain the aircraft at a perfectly level um uh angle of attack and tried to keep it with zero acceleration in the X direction. However, we still were seeing this slope forming in the soil. Um, and this was, uh, you know, something we actually had to apply some corrections to our data uh, based on the soil slope. So that is, you know, a significant source of potential error in our results. And this is something that we're working to fix for the next flight campaign if it happens again with the other soil, the LMS1. Um, we've design a soil leveling system that actually um, blows air like on a diagonal either direction depending on how the slope forms you can kind of pop the soil over to the other side of the sandbox so that's one of the most significant challenges um, that i saw during the flights yeah thanks for that um some more questions in the chat again as a reminder the attendees obviously everybody could also speak up and 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 uh Post a question uh, or put it in the chat. So whatever the preference is. Uh, Andres was uh, posting another question. So that that's immediately related, I guess, to the to the prior one. Do you perform the soil prep multiple times during flight for multiple tests? Right. That that's a yes. specialty of your test setup. I as I understand it from mm -hmm. from your work, from reading the papers, and also from what Chris uh, was describing. That your soil channel, the, the single wheel tester is fully mechanized, let's say, right? So also the soil preparation is fully automated, isn't it? Yes, exactly. So, right, that's right. So between each parabola during the 1G kind of phase of flight, we do perform the soil preparation um, and it's all automated. So yeah, between each test, the soil is freshly prepared. And yeah, from Bongani Zulu, there's a question on, let's say, on the criteria for for similarity or similitude of the soil condition. So was the cone index or the cone use of the cone penetrometer the only the only proxy you use to judge uh, similitude where the soil preparation is concerned or in the scaling loss um, method? Yes. So the the, re, the main motivation for the for the bulk of the you know that work was validating essentially validating the assumption in the design of GRC one. So we did use GRC one uh, the same soil in Lunar G and in One G, and they and we were replicating the 
cone index um, gradient measured in 16G um, in the 1G experiment. So yeah, the both both all the tests were performed in GRC1. So we did not um, look at the um, other soil properties in this specific flight experiment. However, in the future flight experiments, we will be looking at the um, you know a soil that's more similar to lunar regolith itself. So that's like kind of the second phase of the research. All right. Other questions. So oh, sorry, Lutz. Um, I saw. Uh, yeah, I saw Radu Radu Serban had <coughs> had raised his hand. Um, I did. Yeah, and then oh, we we had yeah. I'm we, not we, that we, familiar with the whereby with this tool yet. So yeah, we, yeah. We, we we canceled it too quickly, so it didn't show up. So uh, yeah, before I, I leave the floor to Radu, I would like to remind everyone that uh, in the bottom left corner of the um, of the chat, you will have you will find a round button, and if you click there, you, you will see. Uh, besides the um, emojis, you will find also the raise raise hand option in case you want to to raise your hand to ask a question live. So uh, please, uh, again, we kindly invite everyone to to ask a question. So Radu, please take it away. Thank you. I'm too lazy to type, so I'll just ask. Uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, Early on, uh, you had some scaling uh, values for different quantities. And I noticed that for the drawbar pull force, you had a scaling that was the scaling for gravity and the scaling for mass, which means is the scaling for weight. Right, right, at, yeah. at, at the bottom. So does this mean that yes. the relative drawbar pull has a scaling of one? Does this mean that you could do experiments with a full vehicle on Earth and get the same relative drawbar pull? Yep, that's exactly what that means. Uh, have you as long as you follow yeah, yeah, as long as you follow the other scaling practices right. here. So mm -hmm. so have you considered this? Because so, that's that's an easy experiment to do. I mean, if you have yeah. a full vehicle, right? And uh, that will confirm part of this, right? Yeah, so that's definitely um, one of the recommendations. I didn't really like mention that in this presentation, but that's one of the recommended methods um, for, you know, really easy testing. Um, mm -hmm. The, you know, in the tests we did with these wheels for the Cadre Rover, they were actually the full size, um, full size wheel. But for the, the these ones, they were subscale prototypes just, you know, to reduce the, the cost um, associated with building the prototypes because we just wanted to look at, you know, the different locomotion modes and all that kind of stuff. But definitely um, testing with the full size is um, a good option. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Then there's a question by Nikhil Ravichandran. Uh, uh, so the modified boundary condition, yes, in the visual yeah. observations of the soil displacement, how was that accounted mm -hmm. for in this method? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, it's actually not accounted for. Um, so we're basically assuming that we can still see the relative differences between um, the each experimental condition. You know, we don't. Maybe this is not the exact profile of how the soil would behave in like a free wheel away from the glass but this is the best we can do. And we can still make comparisons between the different conditions because um, we assume you know, that the effect of the, the glass is the same in each case. Um, and then we also have, of course, on top of that, we don't just look at these, we look at the, the other data streams that we have to compare the performance and they kind of all corroborate each other and go together so we can like get the full picture. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a, something that's affecting how the, the optical flow results come out. But, um, yeah, we don't really do anything about that. We just assume that, you know, we're looking at the relative differences between the different experiments. Hope that answers the question. I've, I've got a question. Maybe it's um, when we were, I mean, we were emailing last year at some point uh, about 
your methods and the granular scaling laws, Adriana. And remember, we were discussing a little bit about like 40, 50 years ago, what has been done by uh, uh, in the Soviet the lunar program with the lunar cod rovers, mm -hmm. where similar methods, I mean, parabolic flights were conducted by them at single wheel level to test the performance of the lunar cod, lunar rover wheel um, with reduced gravity applied to the soil. And they also looked into scaling laws at some point. Do you remember, if you remember our, the discussion between us, maybe it's worthwhile to point out um, to the audience a little bit about their approach, how it compares to, to um, what you found out how the scaling laws differ? Right, so um, I don't remember these specifics. I do remember that it was very similar and I can't recall if they were the ones who were looking at, no, I don't think so. The like the reduced density soil simulants, um, but yeah, maybe you could um, fill me in because I forgot about, um, you know, what the... the I would have to look it up myself because it's been yeah. like half a year ago, <laughs> I have to admit. But no, it's. I think it's worth pointing out that a few yeah. decades ago, there have been efforts in that direction as well. Of course, with the technology mm -hmm. available at that time, uh, which was more simple. Um, and uh, actually, the, the demonstrated mobility performance on soils in terms of gradability on the moon uh, of the lunar cod rovers was very close to the predictions that the developers um, had at that time using their methods. So, and they, mm -hmm. again, they looked, they looked at scaling laws and then, however, most importantly, they also performed parabolic flights at reduced gravity um, to arrive at their predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting that, you know, these types of scaling laws have been around for a long time. There right. were research papers I saw from like, you know, the, the 50s, 60s, 70s with, with this type of scaling laws, not necessarily for reduced gravity. Some of them were for reduced gravity applications, but some of them were also for just, um, you know, scaled tests in 1G with different sized um, wheels and stuff like that. Yeah, in fact, I I remember work done in 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 Britain on uh, on scale model testing for of military vehicles uh, mm -hmm. like twenty years ago. So and they may it may still be ongoing uh, work. Uh, so if you imagine, yeah, like tanks uh, and an early development to to get a handle to get a good understanding of um, the mobility performance, um, you may want to resort at that time people would resort to scale model testing to a large extent mm -hmm. uh, prior to the advent of of um, numerical methods yeah so scale models in addition to semi-empirical models or purely empirical models oh oh sorry <laughs> other questions coming up yeah before we go back to the chat uh, i saw that uh, ja and <laughs> had ra yes. raised in yes. their hand and also right. uh, another raised hand. So maybe we can uh, handle. Let's look at that. Yeah. Do you monitor first. the density of the samples prepared on Earth when you test them on the low gravity parabolic flight conditions? Yeah. So the, the, the soil preparation is actually performed during the flight. I don't know if I have a nice slide showing that. Um, the flight trajectory, maybe not. Yeah, you know, it's your mechanical system to prepare sense. the soil, right? In between each measurement. Yeah. That's what I remember. I don't have it. Um, so anyway, um, it, it's performed between each test in the flight. Um, and so essentially you perform it during the 1G phase of flight, you go through the parabola, you do your experiment, and then you uh, prepare it again. So to monitor the density, we, I mean, during the first flight campaign, they took cone penetrometer measurements um, before a parabola and then after a parabola to see, you know, if the 
conditions changed um, at least in 1G before and after the parabola, and they saw no significant difference in, in the soil um, after having gone through that whole parabola phase. The other thing um, is that we can observe at least the level of the soil in the sandbox during the parabola, and we see that um, there's no visible change to the soil level going through the parabola. The soil like, stays in place. It doesn't move around or like lift up or anything like that. So we can see that the density at least has no significant change in that sense. Thank you. Let's uh, give the floor to Corina for a moment. She was raising her hand. Sure. Corina, go ahead. Hi, Adriana. Thank you so much for, uh, for the great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, can you please tell me if you only tested rigid wheels or did you test also any um, flexible wheels on yes. any of the terrains that you uh, presented? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, during actually during this first flight campaign, uh, this wheel is flexible. It's not like one of those mesh wheels, but it's um, it's like a flexible, uh, I don't remember what it's made of, but it's flexible wheel. Um, and it does, oh, I don't have an image. Maybe I'll try to pull up on, um, on my other screen here, uh, an image of one. It's kind of deflecting under the, the wheel load. You can see here, it's like, it's not, um, the wheel load is not applied, so you can't really see how flexible it is. But yes, we did. Um, so that first flight campaign was with a flexible wheel. I would like to show you the image that I am thinking of, um, but I should be able to find it pretty quickly. So none of them were, uh, was a, a meshed wheel? No, we haven't tested with a mesh wheel, but that would definitely be interesting to test. Corina, uh, Corina, I happen to know what wheel that was so um it's basically a prototype for the european exo mars rover wheel which has a solid surface a solid running surface like a sheet mm -hmm. metal and then with internal leaf springs so not um uh, not mesh no uh, on the second question uh if you recall what was the maximum uh longitudinal velocity of the wheel um, so it's 20 millimeters per second. Okay. So, uh, yeah, pretty slow. Thank you very much. That there is a related oh, yeah. question on the wheel, on the flexible wheel that was used in testing. Uh, so did you take, yes. or the flexible wheel, did you take the stiffness into account in the, in the scaling laws? So when you applied the scaling law to the problem, scaling laws. Oh, for the, Flexible wheel, we did not um, actually apply the scaling laws for that wheel. So that was the, we only tested the flexible wheel in the first flight campaign, which was just looking at the reduced weight testing. So looking at, you know, the, just the effect of gravity on the, the soil essentially. Um, and then we had to return the wheel prototype. So we didn't have it anymore. We didn't apply the scaling laws to it, but that would definitely be something interesting to test if we could get our hands on that wheel again. Good. Yeah. Other questions? More questions? So will, when, when you start full time at JPL, will you be able to continue some of this work? Not all of it, obviously, but um, some of it? Um, we'll see. I, I don't really actually know exactly what I will be working on. Um, but I would like to continue this type of work and, you know, in my position, I can potentially apply for, um, at least internal NASA funding for different research projects. So I, I will, um, I would, I would like to continue along this lines and, you know, I will push to to use these types of testing methods in the uh the rover testing that is done uh with whatever mission i end up working on and then of course my lab at concordia they're still they're still following along with this research as well so hopefully they'll get some very interesting results in the in the near future Thanks. good um more comments remarks Questions?
No? All right. Very good. So I think uh, that will conclude it for today. Adriana, thanks very much for the effort to put together the presentation uh, for, for today, for this event. And of course, as, as Massimo will probably be reminding us, uh, this is a series of events that ISTVS are, are staging. Massimo, right? Yeah, exactly. Keep, keep an eye on, the, on our digital event series uh, page. And uh, of course, for those, those of you who are already uh, included in our Newswire mailing list, that you will receive notifications when uh, to announce every every new event new event in the series so um, you shouldn't you shouldn't miss it uh, yeah and I see now uh, someone has put uh, on screen um, on screen this uh, this snapshot for um, this banner for our for our series so you can um, you can find all the details here. I would like to remind you that this digital event series is closely uh, related to our uh, general ISTVS resource initiative. And you can find uh, the link here on the slide. And uh, as, as the slide reads, uh, graduate students are uh, invited to, uh, to join our community and, and contribute to our resource initiative to our digital event series and to all the, the initiatives that our society is trying to uh, carry on. Uh, so uh, we are really trying to, to grow our community in general and our student, uh, also our student communi community. So of course uh, we appreciate everyone getting involved. And uh, as Luz already said, I would like to uh, thank Adriana for taking the time to uh, to share to share with us her very interesting work, and uh, I would like to congratulate her as well for achieving her PhD and uh, wishing her the best of luck for her next endeavor at, at JPL. Really, really great stuff. Thanks so much. <laughs> It was very enjoyable. Thank you all for the great um, questions and discussion as well. Well, thank you. It was our pleasure. And so, well, I, I think this wraps it up. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, thanks to Lutz uh, for being our special host today. Uh, thanks again, Adriana, for being our speaker. And thanks to everyone in attendance. And see every one of you hopefully next time. Have a good afternoon or good evening or good night, depending on where you are. Goodbye. Exactly. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.